exponentially with exponentially with the system size. And uh, hence, it is pretty hard to solve the Hamiltonian explicitly. Even right now, we have some advanced numerical tools or analytical tools. And hence, one of the, and in addition, for a many body system, in principle, we can write down infinite number of UV Hamiltonian concrete lattice model. It is not efficient to just study them one by one. So one of the perspective I will apply, one of the method I will apply is we will try to develop something called effective field theory picture. Sometimes if we are mainly interested in the many body spectrum and their low energy modes, or if we only want to explore the phase diagram and quantum dynamics at low temperature regime or even zero temperature regime, sometimes we can just develop a simple but elegant effective field theory picture, which turns out to be simpler, but they still captures the essential feature of a UV Hamiltonian. And for effective field theory side, we will figure out that it can emerge lots of interesting and striking phenomena, which is beyond their UV Hamiltonian. And one of the most striking phenomena, at least for me, is known as the symmetry fractionalization and emergent gauge field. So sometimes if we only look at the low energy part of the spectrum, we might realize that uh, there are still exists some quasi-particle description of the low energy part of the spectrum. And for these quasi-particles, sometimes they can exhibit symmetry fractionalization. So they carry a fraction portion of the charge. That charge could be electric charge, could be a spin, and could be an optical degree of freedom. And these symmetry fractionalization of the quasi-particle actually implies the quasi-particle itself not to be more complicated and diverse than their elementary constitutes. Because in the UV Hamiltonian or in the lattice model we begin with, we write everything in terms of the boson operator or fermion operator. In the meantime, if we look into the many body spectrum, we figure out that some of the collective excitation do behave like a emergent gauge field in a standard gauge theory. And these emergent gauge field play a role as a gluon which minimal couple with the fractionalized quasi-particle and hence meet a strong interaction between them. So today, what I will focus on is I want to address two types of questions. Uh, first, uh, what type of concrete condensed matter system can emerge symmetry fractionalization of quasi-particle and emergent gauge field? And if they do exist, how can we develop an effective field theory to describe them and capture the silent feature. To begin with, I will review a well-known example, which is the melting transition between a valence bond solid toward a new order or Z2 quantum spin liquid, where at a quantum critical point, there exists a fractionalized quasi-particle, which is the spin on quasi-particle, minimal couple with a emergent U1 gauge field. And after that, well, throughout this talk, we will focus on another more exotic example. That is a phase transition between a 2D valence plaquette solid toward an algebraic liquid phase, which is what we call the both metal. And for such type of phase transition, it contains fractionalization and emergent gauge field, but it is more than that. The fractionalized quasi-particle at a quantum critical point is a spin-on quasi-particle, but the spin-on contain constrained dynamics. So the quasi-particle itself cannot fluctuate in space freely and they have constrained kinetic motion. These quasi-particles with constrained dynamics can give rise to lots of interesting phenomena and could be pretty useful if we want to build some quantum device because they have constrained dynamics. Sometimes they can exhibit a glassy behavior with slow thermalization so if we want to build a robust quantum information storage or say quantum hard drive, uh, intermediate time scale, this is probably something we want to look for. And in addition, at a quantum critical region, there exists some emergent gauge field, but these emergent gauge field are pretty different from the usual gauge theory we are familiar with because it is described by a high rank gauge theory, which has some peculiar feature, including that the low energy behavior or low energy part of the spectrum is totally controlled or even dominated by the short wavelength physics. 
So to pre proceed, let's first uh, review a concrete example of fractionalization in the emergent gauge field in two spatial dimension. And the starting point we will begin with is pretty simple. So let's think about if we have a square lattice or other bipartite lattice and uh, we have a spin one half degree of freedom per site. A typical plate paramagnetic ground state for such kind of spin one half model on a square lattice is known as the valence bond solid, where two spin, which live between the bond, between the link forms an SU2 singlet. So there is a dimer coverage on one of the four links on the square lattice. So this valence bond solid is a typical ground state as a paramagnetic crystal. It doesn't break any spin rotation symmetry, but it actually breaks the crystalline symmetry of the square lattice. The translation in one direction is broken and it also breaks the side center C4 rotation symmetry. And what we will consider soon is the quantum melting transition of such kind of valence bond solid. What does it mean by quantum melting transition is we just want to disorder or kill the valence bond solid pattern and kill the valence bond solid order parameter. And in order to disorder the valence bond pattern, what we need to do is we need to develop a topological defect of the valence bond solid, which I will mention within the slide, and hence induce strong fluctuation between distinct valence bond solid pattern. And this is how magic appears. So, as I mentioned, the valence bond solid is, is a paramagnetic crystal which breaks the crystalline symmetry of a square lattice. And in particular, it breaks the side center C4 rotation symmetry. And the ground state is fourfold degenerate because we can have four valence bond patterns on four of the links of the square lattice. So these are the four distinct valence bond solid pattern and they are related by a side center C4 rotation symmetry. And then a typical topological defect of the valence bond solid is a zipper vortex, where four distinct uh, dimer pattern forms a two prime one D number around this vortex core, and they meet at a singular point, which is the vortex core. This is the vortex pattern of the valence bond solid. And in order to destroy the valence bond solid, what we need to do is we need to proliferate the topological defect of the valence bond solid and hence dis destroy the VBS order parameter and try to restore the spatial symmetry it breaks. However, the subtlety here is at the core of the valence bond solid, there is a free spin one half degree of freedom, which is not paired with any of the nearby partner. So the topological defect, vortex defect of the VBS carries a spin on degree of freedom. And whenever we are proliferating the topological defect, we are in the meantime proliferating these spin lines, which is decorated inside vortex core. Then what quantum number does a spin on carry? So without a spin on, if everything is paired into a valence bond singlet, then the total FZ number is always zero. And whenever we have a Z4 vortex with a free spin on degree of freedom, no matter that spin on is polarizing up Z or down Z direction, the total FZ quantum number change here is always one half. So a spinner carries a half FZ charge, which I will call it magnon charge later. And uh, this is already a concrete manifestation of fractionalization because in the usual spin system, even for spin one half system, the elementary excitation like magnon excitation correspond to locally flip a spin from up to down or vice versa would always change the SZ quantum number by an integer. However, the spin on degree of freedom carries a half portion of the usual magnon charge. So spin on is a concrete manifestation of symmetry fractionalization. And as I have emphasized, whenever there's fractionalization, it is always accompanied by an emergent gauge field. So where's the emergent gauge field here? So now let's look into the spin-on kinetic motion. So assume we are about to melt the valence bond solid. So the spin-on now becomes energetically deconfined. And if I want to fluctuate a spin-on in the background of the dimer, it's pretty simple. If I want to move the spin-on here, I just need to exchange its position with the red dimer. 
or if I want to move the spin on here, I just need to exchange its position with the red diamond. From this pictorial argument, it happens that whenever I want to move a spin on along the path, what I need to do is I need to annihilate the spin on here, create it at the other end of the path. And along the trajectory it moves, I have to reorder in the flip between distinct the dimer configuration. So before I move the spin on, all of the dimer live on even links. And after I move it, all of the dimer now live on odd links. Moving a spin on always requires us to change the valence bond pattern along the trajectory it moves. And this phenomenon exactly corresponds to the fact that there is an emergent gauge field degree of freedom. Okay, so now let's do a simple counting because we are looking into the valence bond solid. So we are actually focused on the link of the square lattice. On each link, there are two possibilities. Either we have a SU2 singlet, or I call this dimer occupied, or it is empty. The first thing I will do now is I will define the occupancy of a dimer on each link as an electric field live on the link. If there is no dimer occupied, then the electric field strength is zero. If there is a dimer living there, then the strength of the electric field is either one or minus one, depending on the sublattice factor of the square lattice. So this is just a simple mapping. I define a dimer coverage in terms of something like an electric field. And remember, we are dealing with a spin one half system. So for each side, if one of the four links adjacent to each side is occupied by a dimer, then the spin is paired. And at this side, there is no spin on quantum number. Otherwise, if all of the four links turn out to be empty near each side, then I will have an unpaired spin on. And hence, the quantum number living here, spin on quantum number, would be one. To interpret this constraint, I can just interpret this local constraint as a Gauss law, which is nothing but a 2D Gauss law in 2D electron mechanism, such that the divergence of the electric field correspond to the dimer coverage on each link determines the local spin on density. This Gauss law is just a reinterpretation of this constraint such that no dimer adjacent to each side correspond to the fact that we have a spin on there. One dimer adjacent to each side correspond to the fact that there is no dimer, uh, there is no spin on charge live on that side. And for the usual electron mechanism, once we have an electric field, the conjugate partner is something we call the gauge connection or gauge potential operator. In the role of this gauge connection operator is it is the operator which either creates or annihilates a dimer on each link. So if I act such kind of gauge potential operator along this path, what it does is it will annihilate the red dimer on even links and create these blue dimers on odd links. So this gauge potential operator plays a role as flipping between distinct dimer configuration. And back to our previous pictorial argument, whenever I move a spin on along this path, I have to reorder the dimer coverage configuration along the trajectory it moves. And in this quantum field theory mapping, that corresponds to the fact that the spin on current operator must be minimal coupled with this emergent gauge field. And this minimal coupling actually means whenever you move the spin on along the path, we have to change the dimer configuration. Otherwise, there is no way for the spin on to move. So at a quantum critical point, the elementary excitation is a spin on excitation, which contains fractionalization because it only carries a half portion of the magnon charge. And this spin on is minimal coupled with an emergent U1 gauge field based on the fact that whenever I move the spin on, I have to reorder and flip the dimer configuration along the trajectory it moves. And this kind of spin on minimal couple with the emergent gauge field in two spatial dimensions does not render a deconfined phase, but it actually generates uh, question. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I uh, missed the beginning. So I don't know whether it's okay to ask questions in the middle or not. Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, okay, thanks. So uh, can, I just, can you clarify in the previous slide, uh, you have the definition of the electric field as this minus one. Uh, can you just 
clarify what this IR and DIR is? Uh, what? In the definition of the electric field, right? Mm -hmm. What is what is the index IR and what is uh, this D of D of I? Yeah, D correspond to the dimer coverage, whether we have a dimer or not have a dimer. IR is actually, okay. this is a square lattice, this is a bipartite lattice, so we can have a sub lattice mm -hmm. factor, it's either one or minus one. Okay, all right. So does I correspond to the edge then? Does I uh, label the edge? Yes, it can define on I any bipartite lattice, it is either one or zero. Okay, all right, okay. And the spin on minimal coupled with the emergent gauge field describe an exotic deconfined quantum critical point, which was proposed by the Boston group probably two decades ago, which described the melting transition of a valence bond solid toward a new order of sometimes a Z2 spin liquid. And at a quantum critical point, the fractionalized excitation is a spin on which carry a half magnon charge, and it is minimal coupled with an emergent gauge field which turned out to be a non-compact U1 gauge field at a quantum critical point. So the deconfined quantum critical point is actually described by the non-compact CP1 theory. So from th this example, we have manifest that the symmetry fractionalization and emergent gauge field can appear in some concrete condensed matter system, like a concrete spin model. The second question we want to answer is, can we go beyond that? Can we have some exotic quantum critical point or sometimes maybe critical phase, which contains symmetry fractionalization and some exotic emergent gauge field, but it is beyond our previous knowledge. So the second example we will focus on is pretty similar to the first uh, example. So we still begin with a 2D square lattice with a spin one half percent. And uh, for such kind of spin one half model on a square lattice, there are two typical plug, uh, paramagnetic patterns. One is the valence bond solid, which we just uh, discussed. And the second is a valence plaquette solid, where four spins live on the four corner of each square, entangled in a way where four spins are actually maximal entangled. And such kind of entangled patterns still preserve part of the spin rotation symmetry, at least the easy plane SZ rotation symmetry and time reversal symmetry is not broken. But again, this valence plaquette solid with four spin entangled on the four corner of a square still breaks the crystalline symmetry of the square lattice. In particular, the translation symmetry in both directions are broken and the side center C4 rotation symmetry is also broken. And what we will do is we want to consider a quantum melting transition of this valence plaquette solid. And what I mean by mel quantum melting transition is I just want to destroy it, the valence plaquette solid order and try to restore the spatial symmetry it breaks. And what we will manifest in just a few minutes is for such kind of melting transition of the valence plaquette solid, at a quantum critical region, they do have fractionalization and fractionalized quasi-particle is still a spin-on quasi-particle, but this spin-on has constrained dynamics. Such that a single spin-on cannot fluctuate in a background of a valence plaquette solid. In the meantime, it also contains emergent gauge field, which minimal with the spin-on degree of freedom. A such kind of emergent gauge field is different from the usual U1 gauge theory we just encountered, and it turned out to be a new type of gauge field where we will call it a higher rank gauge theory. So again, let's first focus on the valence plaquette solid pattern. For the valence plaquette solid, the ground state is also fourfold degenerate because it breaks translation symmetry in both direction. So the unit cell is enlarged in both Tx and Ty direction. And we can have plaquette coverage on one of the four sub lattice in the enlarged unit cell. These are the four distinct plaquette patterns and they're actually related by a side center C4 rotation symmetry. In order to melt the valence plaquette solid, what we need to do is we need to develop the topological defect of the valence plaquette solid. 
And similar to the previous story, because we have fourfold degeneracy, the valence plaquette solid has an elementary topological defect, which is also a Z4 vortex, where four distinct plaquette coverage patterns has a two kind winding number around the vortex core and they meet at a single point. And again, at a singular point, the vortex center, there is a free spin one half degree of freedom, which is not paired with any of the nearby partners. So the conclusion here is whenever we proliferate the topological defect of the valence plaquettes on it, the, the vortex core center carries a free spin on degree of freedom. And as we had already demonstrated, just a few slides ago, such kind of spinner carries a half magnum charge. So this is the existence of spinner is already a concrete manifestation of fractionalization. And whenever there is a fractionalization, remember it is always accompanied by an emergent gauge field degree of freedom. So where does the emergent gauge field appear here? So let's look into the spinner kinetics. Assume we are about to melt the valence plaquette solid. So different plaquette patterns can have resonance and flip different distinct patterns. How can we move the spinner in the background to plaquette solid? So naively, you may say, okay, the story is similar like the valence bond solid. We just exchange the spinner position with the nearby dimer. Now we just exchange the position with the nearby plaquette. But if I want to move the spinner to the right direction and by exchanging its position with the nearby move plaquette, we will finally end up with such kind of configuration that there are two plaquette coverage near each side. Remember, we are assume we're beginning with a spin one half model on a square lattice and one thing can only entangle with one of the plaquette nearby. So this pattern actually does not exist in our Hilbert space. And this also implies that a spinner cannot move to the right by exchanging its position with the nearby plaquette. The same, we can make another try. We can probably try to move this spinner in the y direction, move it down by exchanging its position with the nearby green plaquette. By doing so, again, we finally end up with an obstruction that there are two plaquettes adjacent to each side. And this is a spin one half model and each spin can only entangle with one of the square nearby. So this configuration cannot exist in our Hilbert space. That means I cannot just move the spin on down in this way. So this is pretty peculiar. Even we have a spin on and even it is energetically deconfined. It happened that uh, there is no way for you to move it out in any direction. And such kind of quasi particle, which is totally immobile cannot fluctuate in space and does not have any kinetic motion. It's what we call a fracton. That corresponds to a new type of quasi particle, which itself is not mobile and cannot fluctuate in space. But even a single spinner is just uh, stuck in the Z4 vortex core. It doesn't mean we will finally end up, end up with a true glassy state because even a single spinner cannot fluctuate, maybe can find a pair and move together. So now let's assume we do not just have a single spinner, we have a pair of spinner. So these are two spinner which are spatially separate along the Y link. So this is something I call the dipole oriented in Y direction. And um, we can actually move this dipole, a spinner pair together in a direction which is transverse to their orientation on the transverse drive. So if I want to move this dipole to the transverse direction, all I need to do is I need to annihilate this dipole and along the path and move, I have to reorder between distinct plaquette configuration and then create this dipole here. So from this pictorial argument, I can move a spin on pair, which is called a dipole in a direction which is transverse to their orientation However, moving this dipole still requires us to change the valence plaquette pattern along the trajectory it moves. And this changing of the VPS pattern exactly corresponds to the fact that there is an emergent gauge field degree of freedom. So again, let's do a similar mapping. 
here we are focused on our valence plaquette solid pattern. So let's focus on the center of each square. At the center of each square, we have two types of configuration. We either have a plaquette coverage here, or we don't have a plaquette coverage here. And now what I will do is I will define the plaquette coverage on each square in terms of a high rank electric field, which I call EXY. This is a single component electric field. If this square is empty with no valence plaquette coverage, then the strength of EXY is zero. If there's a plaquette living here, then the strength would either be one or minus one, depending on the sublattice factor of the square lattice. So this is just a redefine of the plaquette coverage. And again, because we're dealing with a curable space with constraint. So for each site, there are two types of possibilities. For each site, if all of the four nearby plaquet are empty, then we have a free spin on the degree of freedom, not paired with any of the nearby partner. For this configuration, we have a spin on charge one at this site. Otherwise, as long as one of the flop four square is covered by a plaquet, then a spin on is paired and the spin on charge at this site would be zero. To translate this local constraint, we can write down or introduce a new type of Gauss law to interpret this constraint. And this Gauss law is something that the dx dy acting on the electric field correspond to the plaquet coverage on each square determines what is the local spin on charge density? This Gauss law is nothing but a translation of this local here of space constraint. But this Gauss law is pretty odd. It is totally different from the usual Gauss law we learn in electron mechanism because there are two differential operators acting on each electric field. So if we focus on this Gauss law and try to do a spatial integral along any row, like only along a row in x direction, or along any column, like along a column in this y direction, we will figure out that the charge number here is not just conserved globally. In fact, the spin on charge on any row and any column are conserved. So this is a very strong symmetry constraint. And this symmetry is now what we call a subsystem symmetry, such that a charge number on any row and any column have to be conserved. And because the spin on charge on any row along x direction and any column along y direction have to be conserved, whenever we create a spin on, we cannot create them in pair like what we did in the valence bond study. Instead, we must create them in a quartet form such that two of them have to live on the same column and two of them have to live on the same row. This is the only pattern which respects such kind of subsystem symmetry, such that charge on each row and each column have to be conserved. And back to our previous pictorial argument. Previously, we figured out that seems that there is no way to move this single spin on out by exchanging its position with the nearby plaquet. And now, from this quantum field theory mapping, it is more obvious. Whenever I want to move this spin on to the right direction along the x direction. Remember, we have a subsystem symmetry such that the spin on charge on this column in the this orange column have to be conserved. So whenever you move a single spin on out, you will actually change the charge or violate the charge conservation law on this column. And that is why there is no way for you to move a single spin on out. It is because the spin on, on any row and any column have to be conserved. Instead, the leading order kinetic motion came from the fact that a pair of spin-on, which we call the dipole, can fluctuate on the transverse drive, which is perpendicular to the dipole's orientation. And this is actually the only way for us to move the charge degree of freedom without violating the subsystem symmetry that the charge on any row and any column have to be conserved. Okay, so now, we have mapped everything in terms of a new type of Gauss law, which implies the charge, spin on charge on rows and columns have to be conserved. And because we try to map it into a electron magnetic theory, whenever we have an electric field, which now corresponds to the fact that there is either a plaquet coverage or no plaquet coverage, the electric field always have a 
conjugate partner, which is what we call the gauge potential or gauge connection term AXY. And the role of this gauge potential term is it will either create or annihilate the plaquette on each square. So if I act such kind of gauge potential term along the path on any stripe, on any row or any column, what it will do it is it would flip between distinct plaquet configuration. Before we have all of the plaquet live on all the lattice. And after I act such kind of gauge potential operator on this stripe, all of the plaquet now live in even lattice. So this gauge potential term corresponds to the fact that we can flip between distinct valence plaquet configuration. Now, back to our previous pictorial argument, the leaf order kinetic motion of the spin-on came from a spin-on pair, which forms something like a dipole oriented um, in question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's not, I mean, maybe uh, something very basic that I don't know, but it's not obvious to me why, uh, in how does, does the action of this holonomy operator um, create these uh, valence band excitations. This is not like uh, something that is uh, obvious to me. <laughs> so, what do you mean by valence band? Uh, so, uh, for example, in when you were talking about um, the valence band solid, right? You there you introduce this 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 operator, right? So this is a mm -hmm. holonomy of a connection, mm -hmm. and uh, so. And here, uh, this is also an, another holonomy of this higher gauge connection. Mm -hmm. And the action of this this holonomy operator, you are saying, it causes, it creates the valence band. Uh, no, or, it's or creates a plaque or annihilate a plaque, but there is no valence band. Create or annihilate, right? So, so that that action, I don't understand. It's not clear to me why. How does this uh, operator create or annihilate? A plaquette, or in the other case, how does it create or an annihilate a valence band, a valence bond? Uh, there's no valence bond. There's only a plaquette. No, no. I'm talking about in the previous case when you talk when you were talking about uh, the valence bond solid. So what the gauge connection operator do here is right. when I acted along this row, it actually annihilate the blue plaquette on one of the sub lattice and create the purple plaque on the other sub lattice. However, there is a qualitative difference. In our previous valence bond solid, actually that U1 gauge theory renders a local gauge flux operator. And that means we can change the dimer pattern locally without changing the other pattern. So what we can do is we can resonate between two horizontal dimers into two vertical dimers and vice versa because we have a local flux operator and that does the job. It only changed the dimer pattern on a square. But here for this gauge potential because of its special gauge transformation which is merely generated by the Gauss law, we will figure out that because here we only have one gauge connection operator for the spatial dimension. It doesn't render any local magnetic flux operator what the only gauge invariant operator without matter field is a global flux operator, which is written here, where it's a global flux defined on any row and any columns. And this also means that if there's no charge degree of freedom, or no defect like a, carrying a spin on, there's no way to locally change the plaque pattern without changing the global pattern. And what it will do is if we want to change the plaque pattern, we must shift each row by one sub lattice or shift each column by one sub lattice. This is why it is qualitatively different from the previous theory. And it also corresponds to the fact that for such kind of higher rank gauge field in two spatial dimension, which we only have a electric field EXY, there's actually no magnetic flux operator. So there is no gauge fluctuation. Okay, thank you. And yes, because this gauge potential operator corresponds to the fact that we are creating and annihilating the plaque along the trajectory it moves. In our previous argument, figure out that the leading order kinetic motion corresponds to the fact that a dipole degree of freedom can fluctuate on the transverse drive. And such kind of fluctuation is always accompanied by the fact that we have to reorder and flip the plaque pattern along the transverse stripe, it moves. And in this field theory mapping, 
this corresponds to the fact that a dipole current operator have to be minimal coupled with such kind of high rank gauge field. The minimal coupling implies whenever we move a dipole in its transverse direction, we, it is essential to reorder and flip between distinct plaquet configurations. And that is the only way for us to move such kind of dipole degree of freedom. Okay, so now it's pretty clear. If we are about to melt such kind of valence plaquet solid, then we proliferate and develop these topological defect, lipo vortex defect, which carries a spin-on degree of freedom. But a single spin-on cannot fluctuate in the background of a valence plaquet solid. Instead, the leading order kinetic motion correspond to the fact that we can have a spin-on pair, which is I call the dipole oriented in some direction, can only fluctuate on the quasi 1D stripe, which is perpendicular to their orientation. And such dipole fluctuation is always accompanied by the flipping between distinct plaquet configuration along the path it moves. So in a field theory language, that corresponds to the fact that a dipole current is minimal coupled with this higher rank gauge field. So now we can probably try to write down a Gaussian theory or minimal theory to describe what would happen for the valence plaquet solid melting or what happened, we are proximate to the melting phase transition point. So whenever we are developing such kind of z topological defect, we are creating excessive number of spin-offs. However, a single spin-off cannot fluctuate in space. Instead, the leading order kinetic motion came from a spin-on pair. And this spin-on pair, I call it dipole, is still a quasi-1D particle because they can only fluctuate on the transverse stripe, 1D stripe, which is perpendicular to their orientation. So if we want to write down a CP1 theory for such kind of spin-on, we will figure out that um, there is no dx or dy theta term for the spin-on, really, because a single spin-on cannot fluctuate along the x-bound, and they cannot fluctuate along the y-bound as well. The leading order kinetic motion came from two spin-on, which can fluctuate in the perpendicular stripe. And in the field theory language, it corresponds to the fact that we have two differential operators, dx, dy, acting on the phase field theta. And in the lattice model, it actually corresponds to something akin to a ring exchange term where we, create a, where we create a dipole and try to move them in the transverse direction. So at a quantum critical point, we have lots of these spin-offs. And a single spin-on can never fluctuate. And the kinetic motion of the strong spatial fluctuation came from a spin-on pair, which can merely fluctuate on the 1D stripe. Usually, if we have a large number of bosons, which are gapless or proximate to gapless, we can expect these bosons to eventually condense. However, the subtlety here is a single spin-on does not have any kinetic motion. They cannot fluctuate in space. So a single spin-on won't condense. And uh, a pair of spin-on as a dipole can at least fluctuate on the 1D transverse stripe. So a dipole could condense. However, because these dipole are quasi, are quasi, only have quasi-1D motion and they only fluctuate on transverse stripe, their condensate would not render any long-range order because in 1D quantum system, there is a murmuring wagner theorem saying that for 1D quantum system, a boson condensate does not give rise to any long range order because here they only have 1D motion that quantum fluctuation is pretty strong to prevent any long range order. Instead, the dipole's condensate will give rise to a quasi long range order with no symmetry breaking. So once these dipole condensate, what we can expect is we finally end up with an algebraic liquid phase which has gapless fluctuations, but there is no long range order between any operator. Instead, if we measure the dipole-dipole correlation after the dipole condensate, which are spatially separate along the transverse stripe, what we will find is they do not decay to a constant value. Instead, they actually have a power law decay, which is much more slower than the exponential decay. This is what we mean by quasi-long range order. And because of this quasi-long range order, such kind of algebra liquid phase is featureless. It is gapless, but there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking. And both the spatial symmetry and the internal symmetry are not broken. 
this is actually pretty elusive in two spatial dimension because in 2D, lots of spin system or hardcore boson systems, we either end up with a gapped phase or we end up with a gapless phase which has spontaneous symmetry breaking like a superfluid phase. It's pretty elusive to get up both liquid which has gapless excitation, but it doesn't break any spatial symmetry, nor does it break any internal symmetry. So how to describe such kind of algebra liquid phase? So actually this liquid phase corresponds to an elusive 2D both metal, which is proposed by the Santa Barbara and Boston group probably 15 years ago. So for such kind of algebra liquid phase after dipole condensate, if we measure the static structure factor, we will see that such kind of structure factor contains a both type of the Fermi surface. So if we look into the low energy part of the many body spectrum, we will find there are some extensive number of exact zero modes live on the Kx and Ky axis. All of these modes are gapless and doesn't cost energy. So this type of gapless branch along the Kx and Ky axis is pretty similar to the Fermi surface in some fermion system where the zero energy modes finally forms a closed line in momentum space. However, here it's a both version of the Fermi surface because the elementary excitation here is a both of. And if we fix momentum, say fix Kx, and look into the low energy part of the dispersion, we will figure out that at each branch of this both type of the Fermi surface, it dispersed like a 1D, or say quasi 1D relativistic boson. So this both surface can be understood as a strong couple version of excessive sub-extensive number of 1D relativistic boson in both X and Y direction. And because now we have some extensive number of zero mode at finite momentum for the whole Kx and Ky axis, we can expect their specific heat at low temperature should be qualitatively different from the usual weak or strongly interacting boson system. In particular, if we measure the specific heat at low temperature region, we will find it actually scales as T low and T, which is similar to some marginal non-Fermi liquid in interacting fermion system. And this behavior is totally contributed by the excessive number of zero energy modes at both Kx and Ky axis. Another exotic feature is from the entangled side. So for 2D boson system, no matter if it is a gapped ground state, gapless ground state, or even critical ground state, if we measure the ground state entanglement entropy, most of them still obeys an area law. So if we make a spatial cut and measure the entropy of a reduced density matrix, the entanglement scale with the boundary or the perimeter of this cut. This is even true for most critical system in two spatial dimension. And that actually implies that for most ground state, the qubits or the entanglement patterns are mainly concentrate near the cup. However, for such kind of algebra liquid phase with a both type of the Fermi surface, if we measure its entanglement entropy, we will find there is a strong violation of the area law. And actually the entanglement entropy scale with L law and L with additional logarithmic correction. So this violation of the area law entanglement entropy of your ground state implies there are some long range mutual information between the spin or the qubits degree of freedom, even they are spatially far apart in the ground state. And we can expect that if we make a measurement or make a projective measurement in the region inside, it will qualitatively change the ground state pattern outside, even they are spatially far apart. Or if we make a projective measurement of the qubits inside, it will qualitatively change the information entropy of the qubits, which is outside and far from the cut. So that's pretty interesting because that also implies such kind of both surface or algebra liquid can be tackled and measured from some numerical measurement by measuring the scaling law of the entanglement entropy of their ground state. And actually this L law and L entanglement entropy is pretty similar to the 2D Fermi surface problem. And the reason why we have additional logarithmic correction in addition to this 
area low behavior is because we have these both surface and each point do behave like a 1D relativistic boson. For 1D relativistic boson, their entanglement and entropy is low in L. And approximately we have L number of branch and that is why we finally end up with such kind of long range entanglement. And finally, the most uh, striking phenomenon in such kind of critical phase is it is actually beyond the usual renormalization group, petrol renormalization group perspective. We know for critical phenomenon like a phase transition point or critical phase, which has a divergent correlation lens, lots of the scaling behavior show universality, which is only dependable to the dimensionality, to the locality, and to the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. And they are usually independent to a UV cutoff or to any concrete interaction or concrete form of the UV Hamiltonian. So one typical observation for the critical phenomenon, which can be demonstrated from the renormalization group picture, is that if we calculated the correlation function at a critical point or critical phase, we will find their power law decay or the scaling dimension of the operator is only dependable to the space-time dimension, sometimes with additional anomalous dimension correction or with a correction from the dynamical exponent. So this result usually holds at a quantum critical point or critical phase, because from the renormalization group picture, we know that at a quantum critical point, everything should be controlled by the long wavelength physics. So what we can usually do is we can do a spatial cost screen, have to integrate out the local fluctuation with a short wavelength physics and only focus on the long wavelength fluctuation. And these long wavelengths mode, which survive in the low energy part of the spectrum, is only determined by the dimensionality, by the symmetry, and by the locality of the interaction. That is why we have this universality of a critical phenomenon. However, for such kind of algebraic liquid phase, which also have a power law decay of the correlation function, if we calculate the density density correlator of the hot cold boson, or say SZ SZ correlator, we'll find. Elbit, it has a power law decay, but this power law decay behavior is pretty odd. This power law decay only exhibits a C4 symmetry. And uh, the exponent here is not dependable to space time dimension. And uh, there's no well known example which match such kind of power law decay correlation function from the universality of the critical phenomenon. So this correlation function or this algebra liquid phase actually challenge our basic notion on the renormalization group picture. Why it fails and what is missing here? So as I had emphasized, one of the most important features in such kind of algebra liquid came from the fact that we have subsystem symmetry because a charge is conserved on any row and any column of the square lattice. And hence, when we write down a Gaussian theory or minimal theory to describe their kinetic motion, there's no dx or dy theta term because a single boson cannot fluctuate on the lattice. And the leading order kinetic motion came from the fact that a pair of bosons spatially separate along x direction can hope along y or spatially separate along y direction can hope along x. Because this theory contains a subsystem symmetry, this implies that there are some extensive number of local fluctuations which correspond to some rough pattern of the theta field, but they don't carry, but they don't cost any energy. So a typical pattern we can plot here is if we plot a theta field in both x and y direction, we can have a very rough configuration like this. For this configuration, it is strongly fluctuates along x direction, but very smooth along y direction. This pattern have a strong local fluctuation and correspond to short wavelength physics. But in our theory, this pattern does not can carry energy at all. And actually, as we learned from the previous both surface, there are extensive number of zero energy points on the kx and ky axis. So there do exist a large number of finite momentum or large momentum mode, which does not carry any, contain any energy or actually contain a very small energy. And if we do Fourier transform for these modes from the both surface, what we'll figure out is these modes correspond to the fact 
that there are strong and rough configuration in one direction, but these modes still survive in the low energy part of the step on. So in this theory, the most peculiar feature is that there exists extensive number of rough field configuration with strong fluctuation, and they correspond to short wavelength physics, but these short wavelength modes still survive at your low energy part of the spectrum, and we should consider them when we build a low energy effective field theory. And this peculiar feature where the short wavelength physics or short wavelength physics fluctuation still survive in the low energy part of the spectrum is what we know as the UV and IR mixing. So that is why the usual renormalization group picture does not apply because for renormalization group, we usually do some coarse grain and assume that the short wavelength physics is not important or at least they do not create any singularity. So we can somehow integrate them out and only focus on the long wavelength fluctuation because that is the only mode which contribute to the low energy part of the spectrum. However, for such kind of fractal system, because we have subsystem symmetry, there would exist a sub-extensive number of low energy mode coming from short wavelength physics, but they always survive in the low energy part of the spectrum. And these are the modes we cannot simply integrate them out, or once we integrate them out, it will create additional singularity to the low energy behavior and hence change your low energy behavior qualitatively. Naturally, such kind of fractal phenomenon and the quantum critical point or critical phase actually opens a new page for new type of phase transition, which have been overlooked before. Such kind of phase transition or critical theory contain exotic feature where we call the UV and IR mixing, merely because of the subsystem symmetry, we will expect there are many short wavelength physics or short wavelength modes to survive at your low energy part of the spectrum. And hence, your low energy effective theory could be very sensitive to your UV cutoff. At a phenomenological level, we can expect there are some new features which was never included in the previous renormalization group or the universality of the quantum critical phenomenon. For example, if we look into the critical exponent or the scaling dimension of an operator at a critical point or critical phase, we'll find that the critical exponent is now independent of the space time. And sometimes, the critical exponent could have emergent fractal dimension. In addition, because we have UV and IR mixing, the low energy effective field theory is very sensitive and dependable to your UV cutoff because we have excessive number of zero energy modes survive at a high moment in region. And all of these phenomena usually appears in fracton phases because for fracton, the quasi-particle have restrict motions due to subsystem symmetry. And because of these exotic symmetry, there exists a sub-extensive number or large number of zero energy modes, which come from the short wavelength physics. And finally, the short wavelength physics actually dominate the quantum critical point in the low energy behavior. Can, can I ask a quick question here? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I understand the point about the critical exponent being independent of the space-time dimension. I mean, the model I thought that you're working with by construction is in two spatial dimensions. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah. mean, how do you reach that conclusion? I mean, do you construct an equivalent three-dimensional model and show that that correlation function is the same? Mm, no. So for most of um, charge boson model at a quantum critical point for the energy density correlation, without the additional anomalous dimension, or if you don't have any exotic dynamical exponent, it only depends on the space time. But here actually, first, it doesn't uh, depend on the space time. And second, it actually has a peculiar feature which only have C4 symmetry. And in three dimension, actually, we haven't figured out a concrete example, which means you have both theory and a numerical evidence. But in other 2D models, we actually figure out a concrete example such that the that uh, exponent here or the scaling dimension of the operator actually has a fractal dimension, which I will actually introduce in just a moment. Okay, I guess let me just ask it maybe slightly differently. So the formula that you just showed, that correlation function for you know n hat with itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my understanding is is that that's specific to the model on the left. Mm -hmm. 
but I guess I'm not sure how you're concluding based on that one particular model that that correlation function is independent of the space-time dimension. I guess I'm not, I don't understand how you reach that conclusion based on the model. You mean, are, are there any other models in, from different literature which shows the similar? Yeah, or, or an, some generalization to three dimensions. I mean, I assume that you need you need another spatial dimension in your model to see whether the correlation function is like independent of the spatial dimension. It is independent of the spatial dimension, but it is dependable to both the spatial dimension and the symmetry dimension of the subsystem symmetry. So here actually the subsystem symmetry implies the charge is conserved on any row and any columns. So what we can foresee is actually the charge operator is now created by a membrane operator and the charge live on the rectangle of the membrane. And actually, this is exactly the area of the rectangle where the charge live uh, at the corner of there. And uh, the question is, do we have similar phenomena in other concrete example or in three spatial dimension, can we expect that there is something similar? Uh, for the first question is, are there other concrete model which exhibit the which exhibit a similar algebraic liquid phase or point and have the similar exponent? The answer is yes. And uh, for three spatial dimension, can we ex expect some similar ph phenomenon? The answer is also yes. Actually, in a concrete model study by Sun Ke and Masu Fisher in three spatial dimension, where the charge, U1 charge, is conserved on any row, any column, and any height, what they can expect is the charge operator's correlation function is one over x squared times y squared times z squared, which is actually a natural generalization of the three spatial dimension compared to this model. Okay, great, thank you. And I think I'm running out of time. Finally, I just uh, end up with a one minute example of uh, another qu quantum critical point coming from the fractal literature, which contains UV and ion mixing. So this is a simple Z2 spin model, quantum spin model on a triangular lattice. And there are only two types of interaction. We have a transverse field and we have a free spin interaction where the free spin interact on any green triangle, which is oriented downward. And such kind of quantum spin model actually has numerically, we can see it has a second order phase transition at a critical point where the strength J is equal to gamma. This model is actually self-due. And if we measure the correlation function, the sigma x sigma x correlation function at a quantum critical point and look for its exponent of the parallel correlation function, we will find the exponent here does not depend on space-time dimension. And actually it exhibits a very exotic number, which is ln three over ln two. This is actually the dimension of the 2D shaping through triangle, which is a concrete manifestation of the fractal structure in two spatial dimension. And this actually implies that at a quantum critical point, the scaling dimension of an operator or the correlation function can, can have emergent fractal scaling dimension, albeit the concrete model we are dealing with is actually a very local quantum spin model on the triangle lattice. And actually such kind of emergent fractal dimension on this quantum critical point is also another peculiar example of the fracton phase transition with UV and ion mixing because for this three spin interacting human mole model, it doesn't have any global Z2 symmetry, but actually contains a fractal Z2 symmetry such that on any shear tensile triangle, you can plot to spatial dimension, the total Z2 charge on that shear tensile triangle is conserved. So I think I'm running out of time. So uh, finally, I would like to wrap up. Today, actually, we're beginning with some concrete example where the system at a quantum critical region with a fractionalization and an emergent gauge field. The first example is the well-known example of the valence bond solid melting toward a new order, where at a quantum critical point, we have a quasi-particle, a spin-on quasi-particle, which only carry a half magnon charge and a minimal couple with a non-compact U1 gauge field. And the second example, it also contains fractionalization and emergent gauge field, but it's actually more than that. The quasi-particle uh, spin-on is a fracton, which does not have any mobility 
and cannot fluctuate freely in a 2D lattice. Instead, the leading order kinetic motion came from a pair of spin known as a dipole, which can barely fluctuate on a quasi 1D strand. Because of this mobility constraint, the dipole condensate finally gives rise to an algebraic liquid phase, which has a power law correlation function and there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking. And what we learn from this example is the fractal phenomenon is usually accompanied by the fact that a system contains subsystem symmetry, that a charge on any row, any column, or any subsystem is conserved. And hence, the quasi-particle itself would have constrained motion. These constrained motion accompanied by a subsystem symmetry can give rise to dotted quantum field theory, which is beyond the usual renormalization group picture. Because of subsystem symmetry, we will figure out that the low energy part of the spectrum is contributed and even dominate by the short wavelength physics. So the usual renormalization group picture or coarse screen picture does not apply because short wavelength physics becomes extremely important in this critical point or critical phases. This is from the new quantum field theory side. And in addition, because these quasi particles have constrained motion, it could be pretty useful. Constrained motion means there could be some glassy behavior their, slow, their solarization could be pretty slow compared to the usual system. And a many body localization effect would be enhanced. And sometimes there are some expensive number of quantum many body scars, which can give rise to partial solarization. All of these solarization implies they turn out to be a good platform to make new device. If we want to make some new, uh, robust quantum qubits for information storage or information process, we probably want something with glassy behavior, or at least a slow solarization. In addition, from the quantum material side, we expect such kind of fractal phenomenon can bring about some new type of phases or critical point, which was overlooked and not yet explored. Today, we're mainly interested in the quantum critical point or the algebra liquid phase, but in fact, Fractons also exist in a zoology of gapped phases, which we call the fracton topological order, where the system do have a ground state degeneracy and a closed manifold due to global patterns. However, the ground state degeneracy is very sensitive to the system size. They could grow but extensively with system size and sensitive to the background geometry. In addition, there also exists zoology of classical or quantum fracton spin liquid, where the quasi-particle excitation, which is something like a spinner of constrained dynamics, and the emergent gauge field turn out to be something like a soft graviton degree of freedom. And this is a third direction we can pursue where we can search for new type of phases of quantum matter with such kind of fracton behavior. So I think I'm running out of time. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my great collaborator, the valence plaque solid. Phase transition story is complete by Jim B, previously MIT, now moved to Penn State, and Mike Krakow from Bowder. And the numerical evidence of these models is actually tackled by Frank Pullman and his group from Technical University of Munich. OK, thank you. Thank you, Yishi, for a wonderful talk. And, and now the session is open for questions. Um, so uh, feel free to interrupt, uh, to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask any questions. Please be my guest. Well, I have a question, if I may. Sure. Um, so thank you for a very interesting talk. This is really fascinating. And it brings some familiar ideas from the past, like the costless Stalin's transition, but, uh, but uh, you, you explained very nicely how the, uh, the phase with plaquette order, then the defect is not mobile and it is this fracton defect. My uh, question is the following, um, how strongly does it rely on a particular geometry of such a broken symmetry phase as a starting point? Uh, for example, if you, if you introduce some defects, some, uh, some impurities or disorder, which could break this long range order of plaquettes. And how robust will the rest of the physics be in terms of uh, these low energy or zero modes that you, that you find? Uh, uh, so, because in real life, we always have something that would break symmetries like that. So uh, I was wondering how robust is this physics of these, of these uh, 
and in particular with respect to this lo local, you emphasize the local uh, fluctuations, then there is a sh some short, short range physics is not sensitive to, uh, to any long range order, but, but, but this, uh, some of the features do seem sensitive. So, so what's your feeling about that? Okay, so let me answer your first question. So how robust uh, is the fracton dynamics in such kind of literature and whether it will still survive if you have some lattice defect? First, how robust it is. This is highly dependable on the fact that when we are about to, when we are melt such kind of valence plaquette solid, the low energy part of the Hilbert space is only made of plaquettes. However, this could uh, change from model to model. So this depends on the UV Hamiltonian. Actually, in some quantum spin models where we just have J1, J2 Heisenberg model on a square lattice, there are some concrete examples which might not to be a weak first order transition between a plaquette solid to or something like a new order of Z2 spin liquid. And the fact is that in the plaquette ordered phase, we only have plaquette. But once we are proximate to the quantum critical point, it is possible that we can break a plaquette into two horizontal or vertical dimers without creating additional energy costs. This could happen at quantum critical point. And once these dimer configurations appear in the Hilbert space, again, the spin on becomes fully mobile and there are no longer fractons. So if we want to have this fracton dynamics persist, when you are proximate to the quantum critical point, we have to choose a Hamiltonian, which has an extremely strong ring exchange term or dominated by the ring exchange term, such that there's no way or it is very energy costing to break the plaquet into two dimer. And second, if we have some disorder like a lattice defect, dislocation, disclination, what would happen? This is a good question. If you barely have a few, I don't think anything would happen, but if you have quite a large number of dislocation disclinations, then their mobility could change because if we have a dislocation, that actually means two stripes at a dislocation center finally merge to one stripe. So previously, a dipole can only fluctuate on the horizontal stripe, but once you introduce additional dis dislocations, they can actually meet it by this dislocation or once you go through these dislocations, a dipole can go up to the other stripe. And if you have a large number of these dislocations or if you make them dynamical and even let them proliferate, then actually the dipole have full mobility. And the second question is because you mentioned it is pretty similar to the KT transition. And the answer is yes, because for this model, although this is a quantum model, we can map them into a 3D classical U1 rotor model, which has subsystem symmetry. And what we will find is there are the elementary defect of vortex, but not vortex of a boson. It's a vortex of a dipole, which is oriented in one direction. And the vortex live on the 2D plane, which is perpendicular to their direction. And the vortex vortex of this dipole also have a logarithmic interaction. So they have a logarithmic energy cost and uh, their entropy is also logarithmic. And hence, there's a critical thermal temperature which proliferate these vortex and finally give rise to a liquid phase toward a disorder phase. But it is again different from the usual KT transition because of the UV IR mixing. And hence such kind of KT transition, the KT point is highly dependable to a UV cutoff. Well, you know, what confuses me is that the KT transition is a perfect example of something that happens only in two dimensions. And it's very strongly dependent on the special dimension. You emphasize how you think that this is something that could exist in maybe in other dimensions. And now local, you know, a phenomena like the Condo effect or, or local quantum impurity, quantum critical phenomena are something that's completely local and independent of dimension. And, and it will simplify in high dimensions. So, you know, one may wonder if something is really independent of special dimension, is there a high dimensional limit of similar models, which could be even simpler and maybe completely tractable analytically, for example, you know? Yeah. So for the usual system without subsystem or without fracton only depend on the dimensionality because dimensionality depend, determines what are the topological defect and the, and the homotopy mapping of the topological defect and the symmetry usually determines what are the defect interaction. And here for fracton, for subsystem symmetry, it depend on first, depend on the spatial dimensionality. Second, it only depend, also depend on the subsystem dimensionality. So here, actually, the spatial dimension is two spatial dimension, but the 
subsystem U1 symmetry is 1D, and that is why the phenomenon is pretty similar to the 1D physics of a quantum, of a quantum spin chain or of a quantum hardcore boson, which can also have a quantum KT transition. And yes, if you want to extend to a higher dimension, can we have similar phenomena? The answer is yes. But whenever you jump into a higher dimension, you have to change your subsystem symmetry toward a higher dimension as well, because both the subsystem dimension, subsystem symmetry dimension, and the dimensionality of the spatial determines what are the low energy modes and what controls the ion physics. Any other talks? Uh, I'm sorry, any other questions? Um, I, I've got a question. So um, you mentioned uh, a reference, of some work by Frank Pullman. Um, I wonder if, well, it, it, um, you know, there are, I assume, studying some um, lattice Hamiltonian that realizes these kind of phases. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say something about that maybe? Yes. So for the for this one, actually there are several lattice Hamiltonian which can realize these phases. First lattice Hamiltonian is for the square lattice or for hard core boson on a square lattice. We only have two types of interaction. One is the ring exchange term on each plaque. And the second is actually a higher order ring exchange term on the larger plaque. So this actually introducing the competition between distinct patterns. And if you only have a ring exchange term on a small square, it actually the ground state would be something like a plaque ordered phase. And if we introduce the next nearest neighbor ring exchange term, it could finally render a algebra liquid phase. A second a concrete example is still a square lattice, but it's more like a super lattice where we have four hard core boson or four spins per unit cell. And inside each unit cell, we have some X, Y, or whatever Heisenberg interaction between the spin. And between the unit cell, we still only have ring exchange term. So this again, create a competition between either intra-unit cell X, Y interaction, which favor one pattern, and uh, inter-unit cell ring exchange term, which favors another pattern. And at a quantum critical region, this can exhibit such kind of algebra liquid phase with a both surface. Very interesting. I um, have to take a look at that. <laughs> um, any other questions from the audience? Oh, all right. If uh, well, I, more, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I have, I have uh, again back, yes. what, yeah, Please, what, go ahead. what might probably be a trivial question, and so if if. Uh, it's possible uh, to answer it, mm -hmm. which is again that when you when you go back to the valence bond solid, mm -hmm. uh, that and the beginning of your of your mm -hmm. of your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, so this this gauge field, right? You're saying it creates an uh, annihilates a valence band. Gauge potential, yeah. Gauge potential, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, that is something that is not clear to me. Why does the gauge potential create or annihilate a valence band? Yeah, so first the why on each side is create a nonlinear valence band because gauge potential term is the conjugate operator to the electric operator, just like X and P. And hence sure. the electric operator correspond to zero or one correspond to whether you have a dimer here or not having a dimer here. And this E to the IA is something like a creation operator, which make empty to a dimer or make a dimer to empty. And the, the subtlety here is because we have this IR, a sub lattice factor. So at this site, actually having a dimer is one and at the nearby link, having a dimer would be minus one. So if we act here, it's actually creating this sub lattice, annihilating the other sub lattice or for any closed loop, you are creating one sub lattice, annihilating the next step, uh, again, creating the next step. That is why you can make this configuration to the other blue configuration. Right, and, and so this operator doesn't act locally, right? I mean. It it, it shifts the entire uh, set of valence bands, uh, all, cool. all of them, right? Cool. So it, if you have this operator, which is more like a holonomy along this row, yes, mm -hmm. it shifts everything on the row. However, this mm -hmm. U1 gauge field in two spatial dimensions do have a local magnetic flux operator, which is just a curve of A. And uh, mm -hmm. this magnetic flux operator actually change the pattern locally. So for each square, 
if we have two mm -hmm. horizontal dimer and I act this magnetic flux operator, which is the curl of A, it make two horizontal to vertical or to make two vertical to horizontal. Okay, all right. All right, uh, thanks. Thanks, I appreciate it. All right, if no other questions, we thank Yishi one more time. Thank you very much uh, uh, for sharing your wonderful uh, ideas. And uh, we invite you to join us again next week for another Quantum Matters seminar. Have a wonderful rest of the week. And don't watch the news if you're uh, on your way to, to bed. You're not going to be able to sleep. Good night. Thank you.